So the NASC seminar is very happy to have uh, Professor Lan Swan Huang of the University of Connecticut to present P Positive Mass Theorem for Asymptotically Hyperbolic Manifolds. All right, uh, thank you for having me. So I will start um, talk about some basic stuff. So um, we we'll consider the, since we're talking about manifolds, which somehow very similar to hyperbolic manifold. So let's start with hyperbolic space. So for n-dimensional hyperbolic space, there are many ways to write down the matrix. So uh, I will mainly using the hyperboloid coordinate, which is if we think about the Minkowski space of one dimensional higher with the coordinate T denotes the time and then the spatial coordinate X1 to Xn and with the Minkowski matrix. Right, and then we can think about the hyperbolic space is actually an embedded hypersurface inside. So it's inside this um, M, um, one plus N dimensional Minkowski space a given by this quadratic equation. So it's a, a hyperboloid in the Minkowski space time and where the, the, the equation will give you two connected components. We are looking the one which is in the positive time. So if we draw the picture, so this is T coordinate and this is X1 and I suppress this X2 to Xn coordinate and then you will look like a, a hyperboloid. And if we look at the induced matrix, it's actually a Riemannian matrix. So in other words, it's a, a, a space-like submanifold. And induced matrix can be using if I use uh, the uh, spherical coordinate for the spatial coordinate x1 to xn, where r is the radius, then I can write the induced matrix on the hyperbolic space as this coordinate. Where r um, is the, the polar radius, which is um, greater or equal to zero, where r go to infinity, the, the surface go to the infinity here. So here is when r goes to infinity. And, but also I want to, as a motivation, so I will mainly using this coordinate, but I will also as a motivation to write a coordinate after you conformally compatify it. So after you change variable, then you can write uh, this as uh, the B, the matrix, Let me write as this uh, conformal factor of one over cosine square. Right and here, this is the um, the unit is the round matrix on the unit sphere. Okay, and here the row becomes um, finite. So or we change from the radius can go all the way to infinity to rho where rho is greater or equal to zero, but it's less than pi over two. Because you look at the factor here, when rho is pi over two, it blows up. But then for the moment, let's ignore this factor. When rho at the pi over two, this actually becomes a matrix. And when rho is pi over two, this becomes one, so, um, and this, because we are restricting the slice row is a constant. So the induced matrix just become the round matrix. So that's just a way to write down like a Poincare disk, probably uh, most people are familiar with the way to represent hyperbolic matrix. So this become a disk and a high dimensional disk and the, uh, here is where rho is zero and the boundary or the conformal boundary is rho equals to pi half. 
So that's where the matrix is not really defined. But then um, you can think about uh, this code somehow the boundary we somehow bring it back to the finite region. So it's usually called conformal infinity, conformal boundary at infinity. And which is what rho is pi half. And but as drama you can write down, it's actually really just a sphere, topologically sphere with the raw matrix. Okay. So there's a, um, so here we are really looking at the hyperbolic space sitting in the space time, the Minikowski space time. But there's actually another way to think about how do we put in the space time? That's in the so called anti decitter. So anti-decitary uh, space type, the Lorentzian matrix. And then if you're looking at, let me write down the matrix. So there's a uh, time direction and there's a special direction. Yeah, here, if you remember uh, the hyperboloid coordinate I wrote in the previous uh, slide, and you'll see when T is constant, that means you're looking at time slice. The time slice has exactly the same induced matrix. So that's the space time where each slice exactly is hyperbolic. So again, we can do a uh, change of variable to bring the boundary, to bring infinity back to the finite region. So if we change your variable, and then you can write this, the factor one over cosine square rho and some time d tau minus d tau square. Okay, so um, here rho again goes uh, become finite. So here r goes to positive infinity, but rho goes from zero to pi hat. And again, when time is constant, if you're looking at the tau slice, constant tau slice, this exactly is the, the way we write the Poincare disk. Okay. So then the conformal uh, boundary of this space time becomes when rho is equal to pi over two. So you ignore this, but just looking at this restricted one, rho equals pi over two. So you see this factor disappear and this becomes one. So what you get is really a cylinder. And then you have the cylindrical, the flat cylinder matrix. All right, so this is actually a Minkowski if you unwrap this, um, this cylinder. So this is a Minkowski matrix on the boundary. So if I draw the picture, you will think about I have a cylinder where this vertical direction is the tau direction. And then for each slice, you have a Poincare disk. So this is when rho is zero and the boundary is when rho is pi over two. So this um, anti-decitter space time somehow appear in general relativity since it's a Lorentzian matrix. So it's a, a vacuum solution to the Einstein equation, but it's the Einstein equation with negative cosmological constant. So, or in other words, the rich equation of this uh, anti-decita space, I will usually write ADS, is um, some negative constant lambda. 
So it's Einstein with negative Ricci constant. However, from the a classical general relativity, this space-time is really not physical. So somehow it doesn't match the uh, observation we have for our universe. So first, there's a very fundamental reason this space-time is not global hyperbolic. So which uh, from uh, definition, it means there's no Cauchy hypersurface. Right? And here, in this picture of the um, ADS space, after you conformal compactify it, it has important thing is a conformal change. So the angle uh, doesn't change. So this 45 degree, it will still indicate the where the light goes, the no direction. So suppose you have an event happen here, and then you want to say you are able to determine the event from the past. So you are looking at the causal past of this event. So let's do the 45 degree. And then the causal past is here. But then from the picture, you can see actually hit the boundary. So in other words, if you uh, go back to the previous space time, which is not conform compatify, that means this event is not really completely determined by any slice in the past. So they'll be determined by something from infinity, which we really don't know what is. So then if you take any space-like surface, there's a causal curve which doesn't intersect yet. So it's not, uh, it will be no Cauchy hypersurface. So this space-time, in other words, is not deterministic. And there's also um, some recent work show as the evolution point of view, where you're thinking about once we give a, a slice in time, time slice, and then you let the Einstein equation to run the all the work, to do the all, all the work to determine space time. And then from that point of view, this is actually not a stable solution. So in other words, if you um, borrow this picture again, so if you have a slice, which somehow uh, is very similar to the Einstein matrix. You perturb it slightly, but then the time, uh, the space time development may not be very close to ADS. So let's, um, that statement why I say is still open, but at least for the case, if you add a matter field, it's been uh, proved by um, much, most cities in, in the recent years. On the other hand, uh, people are still very interested in ADS space or anything like behavior like ADS space because there's another um, branch in physics, in theoretical physics, they are really interested in so-called the holographic principle. So that's some idea uh, was proposed by physicists around 90s by uh, Tay Wolfs. And I just write some names, so it's a, a very big field. Uh, Saskind around 90s. They say, if you want to unify quantum mechanics and gravity, and you are really thinking about you have a three dimensional world and the information can store in one dimensional higher uh, artificial space. Right, so it's something like uh, the hologram we see. How do you see the 3D movie? So they have this idea, but it make precise by um, uh, Juan Medicena. So to give us some so-called ADS CFT correspondence. So it's around 97. 
right? So what it says is we have the uh, ADS here, and then we have the theorem, which is the gravity sitting inside the interior of this cylinder. And then you have quantum mechanics, especially the conformal field theory, which sitting on the boundary. And there's a duality. So if you do computation on the boundary and you will be recovered by doing computation in uh, the gravity way in the interior and vice versa. So what really roughly speaking, it says if you have the interior is described by gravity. And in particular is a gravity of something like anti-deceitor space. So here to be precise, put a dimension five because they are thinking the boundary is a four dimensional uh, space time. So then you have the conformal theory on the boundary. Uh, let's see. So here is a conformal boundary. And then you have a correspondence between these two. So they, they actually say more precise, like uh, uh, this have some certain type of string theory. And then on the boundary, you have this some kind of yen mills uh, theorem and the computation actually can be recovered from either side. So a general question of this correspondence asks you about How does the conformal boundary determine the interior? So that's a general question of this type. Although uh, I think it's uh, interesting in some kind of different direction, but it all falls in this general scheme of the question. So for example, one thing you may ask, if you have the conformal boundary is the same, right? And then there you compute all this, your physics theory, quantum mechanics, you get the same computation. Does that actually recover the same interior? For example, if you have the same conformal boundary, does that imply the same interior and vice versa? So one thing, uh, one possibility to uh, approach this kind of question is we'll think about we're really looking at as a, a slice, we're looking at the Riemannian manifold with that Riemannian boundary, conformal boundary. And then if we have as a Riemannian manifold, if we have some property of conformal boundary, we know it's the same, does that tell you there's a, a unique interior Riemannian matrix inside? And then once you show if for a time slice, you have this property, and then you can probably patch together by the um, local existence for each, domain of dependence, and then, then you patch together the space time. So for that purpose, let's define a Riemannian manifold. So for now on, I will just focus on Riemannian manifold. So we have a Riemannian manifold of n dimension. Okay, and then we say it's asymptotically hyperbolic. I will write just AH later. So if we say as in time hyperbolic, we were really thinking about at infinity, it looks like a hyperbolic space, right? So instead of using uh, this Poincare Dix model, I'm going to using this as my like a background hyperbolic matrix, the one where R goes to infinity. 
So if the metaphor itself, outside compact set is like exterior of the hyperboloid so for compact set. And where the matrix, the Riemannian matrix goes to the hyperbolic matrix with some decay. So R, remember, goes to infinity. So this term with negative power goes to zero. And we also assume some condition on the scalar curvature. So we assume the scalar curvature uh, goes like uh, the scalar curvature of the hyperbolic space, which is minus n times n minus one. So somehow this decay can be weakened by some decay at lower rate. And sometimes we usually not only say it's decay at the C0 sense, but also decay in the sense of multiple derivative. But I will not go into that technical part in this talk. So this kind of question actually was already studied by uh, mathematician, by Minu, even before all these kind of ADS-CFT uh, craziness. So by Minu, he wanted to generalize the positive math theorem, which was studied for manifold model on the Euclidean space. But now he just said, why can't we just looking at the hyperbolic space? So you are able to modify the spinner proof to show the following results. So if the matrix, as we mentioned here, the Riemannian matrix, if it's exactly hyperbolic outside a compact set. And then we also assume energy condition, which uh, also from general activity, some energy condition, the scale curvature cannot be less than the scale curvature of a hyperbolic space. And then what you conclude is the matrix has to be everywhere hyperbolic. So there is also a, a further refinement, uh, the strength of the work by uh, Anderson, Lars Anderson, and Matthias Stahl. So then since the motivation comes from the positive mass theorem, one may wonder this statement somehow looks like a rigidity statement of a positive mass theorem. Can you actually have a full positive mass theorem? So first, what would be the invariant you consider which analogous to the mass in the asymptotic black case? So usually the invariant comes from symmetry. And in this case, it actually comes from the space-time symmetry. So if we go back to the, uh, let me probably copy the hyperboloidal to my slides down there. Go next slide. So in the space time is just Minkowski and Minkowski uh, symmetry can be read as a killing vector field. So in particular, we can look the killing vector field which come from translation. So we have this time direction which is a killing vector field but we also have a spatial translation. We have this D x1 and all other n minus one direction. Okay, so this is a vector field on the ambient space, right? So how do you write as a quantity defined on the, the hypersurface, which is our interest, the hyperboloid here. So there's a way is um, to, if we looking at the normal vector of the hyperboloidal. And then we'll find out the projection. So the tangential part and the normal part, somehow they give you uh, encode the information. It's an ambient killing vector field can be read by looking at the normal and tangential parts. So in this case, in this very special case, we're only looking at normal projection. So the normal, normal projection, uh, of the space-time killing vector. Also, another name is called lapse function. Okay. So then uh, in this case, you have the time translation, you project, you get a quantity 
if I write in the sprinkle coordinates, it will be one plus R square and take a square root. And then all other special translation, if you project down here, the normal part, you'll just recover the coordinate function. Okay, so this quantity are called static potential. So by using the ambient killing equation and reduce on the slides, you can actually find out they satisfy the equation, a very special equation on the hyperbolic manifold. So it's a high CN of the, all those function F0 to Fn is satisfied. This is also called the uh, Obata equation. Okay. And generally, for any Riemannian manifold, you can say a manifold is static or a function, a scalar value function is called static potential. If um, the, uh, the function f satisfies some very special equation. So the equation is given by, is a, a tensor equation. So that's the minus Laplace times the tensor matrix plus the Hessian minus f times Ricci equals zero. So this also has very interesting relation to the study of scalar curvature and which the equation exactly is the linearized scalar curvature. And then you take a formal adjoint. And from some physical reasonings, static manifold somehow usually represent the ground state. So if you have something um, which minimize the mass is a mass minimizer. It should be very special in the sense probably it should be static, a static manifold. So using low static potential and in view of really obtain the positive mass theorem as a first step to find out what the mass is, there's a definition. So there are already many definition, but the one I'm going to use is by Sheldon Wang and uh, is tend to more general asymptotics by Kuchel, Hoselake. All right, so here is the definition of a mass on a general asymptotically hyperbolic manifold. So we have a matrix G, and then we're looking at the difference subtract from the background hyperbolic. Let's call that uh, tensor E, so it's a difference. All right, and then we have a, a um, the hyperbolic static potential. So we have this F0, F1, Fn. For each one, we compute the following quantity. It's defined to be quantity at a very large coordinate sphere. You are going to let Sr to be a very large coordinate sphere of this following quantity. So I'm sure my index is probably a bit confusing in this, my bad handwriting. So please let me know if you see any questions. Excuse me, this is a derivative of the third index. Uh, you mean for the definition of this one? No, yes, and you, what you wrote on the bottom. You have three indices and two for metric. And the third index meaning what? Oh, uh, yes, that's the derivative. J again, but it's J. I, J I, is J. the partial derivative, it's the B derivative in J direction. So it's, yeah. so, so the third index is derivative. It's a two derivative. EIJ is a tensor. Ah, a IJ tensor. also, E was already EIJ, was already a tensor. So right. when, now third index is derivative. Which index is derivative? The I, um, let me see here, I and J is the derivative. So in other words, uh, this, the last the, I, the last I. Oh, the, the last the, I. The last, because oh. I have two I's, the last I is derivative, I'm checking, okay. 
Oh yeah, sorry, I'm missing the normal derivative. So the normal direction, so it will contract with J. Does that make more sense now? So this is a, a vector and you contract in normal direction. So it's a flux integral. And this one, um, let me use blue. So this is this tensor and then you do the B derivative in the di direction. Okay. All right, and so this formula already quite complicated and you so you can understand why it takes a while for people to find out uh, the formula for the hyperbolic case. And, but it follows from the very similar general principle is coming from somehow you do a integral in interior and then you're looking at how the density, energy density uh, subtract from the background one. So scalar curvature of the matrix minus the background. So which should be. Should be but let me ask you again, how many derivatives if you assume to decay? Um, so, <laughs> right. I mean, for the definition, you just need one decay. Um, I think for, sorry, for definition, I think you need one decay plus the scalar curvature mm -hmm. condition. But then for the positive mass theorem, I'm going to mention, I will not specify the derivatives, but usually you require more like plus two or three. And for our rigidity, we probably need four derivatives. Okay, so it's roughly coming from this and then you do some analysis to get the boundary turn. So this is interior, but then you get boundary flux into and use the static equation to cancel out when you have a higher order derivative, two derivative on F, then that will vanish by the static equation. Okay, so then this recipe tells you whenever you have static potential, it should come up uh, invariant. And since for the hyperbolic space, we have n plus one static potential. So we get the quantity, um, which some people call is called the mass linear momentum vector. Where mass is the zero term from your two time translation and linear momentum is from where you, you do the spatial translation. So P zero is this formula plug in with the projection of the time translation and PI is this with the, uh, the, the spatial translation, okay? So for the positive mass theorem, we'll say this is a, a vector, right? But you really say somehow the Lorentzian norm of this quantity has a sign. So the positive mass theorem says, um, now a Riemannian manifold dimension n, if it's asymptotic hyperbolic, the scalar curvature has lower bound by n minus n times n minus one, then P zero is greater or equal to the length of this momentum. And with equality, if only if uh, that recovery the hyperbolic space. So the hyperbolic space we write. Okay. So this uh, has been proven for the spin case by Sheldon Wang and uh, Kushal Herzlake. Just as they find out the formula, essentially they're, in, some, in some way they use the spinner argument and see what the boundary term you get. So then they recover, they, they find out that's the definition for the mass. Although definitely it's more technical than what I just described. So there is a also interest in the general case when the manifold is not spin. For the general case, there's a proof by uh, Anderson, Lars Anderson, uh, Tai, Min, Min Liang Tai, and Greg Galloway. And there's a, they assume some um, special condition on the asymptotics. And without that extra assumption, this done recently by Kushel and Delay. They actually using the positive mass theorem for the asymptotic flat manifold as part of the argument there. Then um, in these two, in for the general case, in these two proof, they don't have the rigidity because it's very well, similar. Excuse me, excuse me, but they, they yes. work, I think, only up to dimension eight. Yes, you can put that way. Thank you. Yeah. 
and the, and then it also of course follows from the corresponding statement for cusps yeah uh, right if you if you'd have a little hump deformation then yes. it's more obvious it follows from the cup or their condition is more subtle because there is a uh, better result right once you you know it's only you know the cuspidal manifold then you have it Pro provided of course you have you can make it flat infinity or flat meaning hyperbolic sense correct um so the locans argument eight. no no it's not seven it's eight it works up to dimension eight Right, I think, but I, I'm not sure about the hyperbolic case, the asymptotic flat case in dimension A, you have some perturbation argument. So you no, work. in dimension A, there is this smile argument which is the escape okay. gravity. Thank you. But again, I, I, but I, I have in mind argument with cuspidal geometry. Their argument is somewhat different, but cuspidal geometry makes much easier. It's, it follows from general kind of, from general principles. Very nice. So is it, uh, so I can find reference somewhere? Hmm? Um, so is it posted somewhere? No, no, but the, the, the cuspidal thing is considered, you know, it's in my lectures. Yeah, if you look in my lectures, it's written okay. there. Okay. Four it's, lectures? It's, it's, it's all the result, yeah. Yes, it was okay. formulated. But eight, of course, eight is recent because smile, smile theorem appears after, after, no, after some moment. Yeah, you get to use smile theorem. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. So for the equality case, I, I don't know if your method also work for equality case, but if, if you use this kind of contradictory, like a gluey, like color, probably you also doesn't cover the equality case. Then equality case is uh, done by, in my work with uh, Yang Chu, Zhang, and Daniel, uh, Dan Martin. Okay. Yeah, this is usually more difficult because equality is somewhat more subtle, yeah. Right, so the equality case, uh, since the proof is not direct, so equality case has to be handled differently. So I will not really uh, talk about the detail of the proof. I can give you some, like a general idea of the proof. But but you, you can see the spin case or? Uh, I'm considered uh, general case. The spin case is being done by. Uh, it's but lower dimension, but lower dimension, okay. Right, and this equality case holds for general dimension as long as you give me a positive mass theorem. So if you know it's true, we don't know what we don't know. What, we don't need to know what proof you use. But if we know the positive mass theorem, uh, the positivity of mass holds, then then we have the equality. So in some sense, you can, can you hold for general remark? dimension. If you accept the recent, well, relatively five years old paper by, by Shen Yao, then you don't need any dimensional distinction at all, right? Mm -hmm. Because they have this kind of this uh, technical lemma in their paper, if you are, which, which says we can avoid singularity. Because you see, in the in the cuspidal case, you just reduce it to the torus, to the flat torus, and if mm -hmm. you know, and, and so you continue with this process. Therefore, if you have this two-dimensional kind of two-dimensional reduction lemma by mm -hmm. Sean Yao, you have it. And right. In fact, you have more general class of manifolds. Yes. Than the one you have. It's not just cuspidal, the only transversal section must be in Shun Yao class. It's more general mm -hmm. class of manifolds. Mm -hmm. But the question is if, I don't know if it's accepted so far this uh, this paper, Shun Yao. I don't know what's the status of this. Because yeah, even, I don't know. Of course, but there, of course, the question of rigidity may be more subtle. Yeah, you have to look at the proof. Because, but the inequality, anything just in this context, not it's not really about all okay, theorem in this field, but this particular theorem easily follows. Because you see, the cuspidal case you use it in, in one step to the case of flat torus, to, the, to this case of the torus, essentially to, to flat uh, positive mass theorem. You see, because what I'm saying, if you, if you know I something know. flat infinity, then flat after division by the cuspidal group. And then for the cuspidal group, you have this. Uh, uh, usual argument by as a word product, which is similar but different from uh, crucial delay, it's more elementary. Mm -hmm. The same as for the usual positive mass theorem. Once you have this reduction by Lockham, then it just you say hi, it's just divided by, by a group, and you have flat torus problem, right? Right. Yeah, definitely. Then level recovery, but um. So your your lecture notes also has the initial data set case. Oh, I know in the Iranian case you have the proof, right? 
and but it's also for the initial it's, it's reminding, yeah exactly also only reminding okay. in general i never thought about that i can say it yeah okay um so probably let me uh say something like uh, for the equality case you will hold as long as the positivity holds so we use uh, you will see in our argument so i would just um probably highlights the argument. So here the proof of equality is by constraint minimization. Right, so this um, general idea can probably goes back to Barnick. I'm sure it goes back to physicists, but you've never been really redone in this way. But Barnick in 2005, in um, attempt to show something about quasi-local mass, he has a general outline of this argument. And in my work with Dan Lee, we carry out in the, um, the setting which we can use for the space time, for the one with initial data set, space time, positive mass theorem or asymptotic flat manifold, uh, asymptotic flat initial data set. Mm -hmm. Right, and we find out the proof, um, this general approach is actually quite adaptive. So we can use two different settings. And the first thing is we need to, so suppose we have a manifold with equality, with the equality, mass equality. And then, um, so then we show is uh, we find the functional is actually the minimizer. It's a, um, minimizer of a functional so-called the uh, Reggie title bone, Hamiltonian. Right, and but it's a minimizer among the scalar curvature constraints. Hmm. Okay, so then it's a, a minimization problem with constraints, and in calculus we know there's a, a Lagrangian uh, multiplier method method of Lagrangian multiplier, which also works in this infinite dimensional setting of Banach space. Right, and then in this case, using that, we can conclude um, the minimizer actually has a more structure, it actually has to be static. So it has a static potential. And now the final uh, conclusion will come in from approving something of static uniqueness. So you want to say a manifold with this kind of problem is static. So there's a subtlety where the static potential can have zero or not. So you have to show the static potential has to be positive mm -hmm. everywhere in order to get this uh, static uniqueness. And that's the outline of the proof. But excuse me, you, you don't have specific topology, how we make variational problem when topology is not fixed, I'm confused. I'm fixed topology. I'm really say I have a, a fixed manifold. I have manifold with um, given space and the matrix is a mass minimizer among all the competitor matrix, which will be the same mate, will be the matrix satisfy a scalar curvature condition defined on the same topological space. But then if so topology I'm, was wrong, you will never recover your manifold. Uh, exactly. So we actually, I don't have probably I don't have time to go into lots in the hyper in the locally hypervalue case, uh, we do have this case uh, situation. We can only say if it's a minimizer among the space which you fix topology, and if it's a minimizer, we know it's static, and we know what exact geometry it has by static uniqueness. But in the case of as in topic locally hyperbolic. There are actually example we show among this class, the zero mass is a minimizer, but there's actually another candidate of different topology, which is a negative mass. So you don't recover that. Mm -hmm. 
you know. It's, Does that make sense? Well, I'm, I'm afraid. Can you explain maybe this idea in the classical case in the Euclidean space? Just to in the Euclidean space. So um, let's see. So in so the as an case. It's the usual positive mass theorem. You just have as many fold flat infinity, positive each coverage everywhere. Right. And you want right. to so then... it must be flat. How you argue? Oh, I see. So I, I see what you So here, if you have a minimizer, you know it has zero mass. And you don't really know any topology. Minimize, okay, yeah. What exactly minimize? Minimize among all the asymptotic flat matrix, which uh, has non-native scalar curvature on this topological manifold. Oh, okay. And okay. how but do you then, know this minimizer exists at all? Suppose, so here we are really handling just equality case. Suppose we know it's an equality case holds. So suppose we have equality, then we know we already have some manifold, which is equality, then we show that manifold has to be flat. But you minimize among all of them, but then you have this particular solution. So let's say put this way. So we only, so before we don't show anything about topology beforehand, but then at this minimization argument, we can show it actually has to be static and then it comes from the static uniqueness. It actually has to be flat. No, but what worries me? You a priori know that it is minimizer or not? I know it's a minimizer. I assume it's a minimizer. I, I, I already know this is minimizer. Um, How do this so, particular is minimizer? Um, so that relies on the positivity proof. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so positivity tells us every like every manifold is happy flat, non-native scale curvature has to have non-native mass, right? But I know flat is the one with zero mass. And now the thing is, suppose I have another matrix which I don't know is flat or not, but if with the mass zero, then I okay, show you that one. Compared to what to be... I understand better. So in the flat case, if you have this extreme situation, you know by some perturbation argument of, of Kajdan and Warner, it must have positive zero Ricci curvature. Mm -hmm. And when, when it has zero Ricci curvature, the splitting theorem and you split. And what I guess what you do is a kind of elaboration on this argument in the hyperbolic case. In, in some way, that. yes, in some way. So Shen in the flat case, yeah. Shen Yao original proof, essentially using this custom Warner argument, yes. right? But here somehow we don't prove it's Ricci flat. So one thing which can be done in the Riemannian case by Shen and Yao is they show the manifold is actually Ricci flat and then you classify well, In this Ricci case, flat. you can claim it's a Ricci curvature equals a Ricci curvature of the body space. There's no, but we cannot. implies. And once this so, so by perturbation so, argument, it must be, okay, yeah. I think the same perturbation argument your books, okay. No, okay, no. I understand, I understand, okay. Okay, you understand, but I was still want to say, well, the mm -hmm. thing is we prove it's a static. It's um, one step less then proving is Ricci constant. But once it's static, then you can actually prove it's Ricci constant. No, no, but you see just how it works. So I get a Ricci, I get a Ricci. Then how from the Ricci you go to the general case, okay, I also see that, yeah. Because for Ricci argument is very simple. If you know manifold mm -hmm. has right Ricci curvature, then everything follows by very simple argument, right? Mm -hmm. Similar to splitting argument. It's even easier here, right? right? And, and then so, and in Ricci argument, it's local. It's really infinitesimal. Because if you mm -hmm. have Ricci wrong, you always can move it in the direction of Ricci and make the scaly curvature better. Okay. I know. Right. But the I thing understand. is, we can we cannot prove it directly is Ricci. We show it's static, you and know, then okay, we show... Well, but you, you can do it with, in, in, in this in that way. But again, there's you... Yes, it's, yes, yeah. Essentially, we again, it's proof it's it's Ricci, yeah. Enough, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. All right. So you show so, that you, you, but your solution admits deformation, which moves you out of the, of the theorem, essentially. You say, if you have the best solution, you always can perturb it. And perturbation, there is, a, there is a perturbation which makes it's a theorem being violated. Okay, I see it. I see it. And that's what already was uh, static or whatever you call it. Okay, I, mm -hmm. I understand the logic. Okay, yeah, very I good. I don't understand why I need variational principle, but sort of, but you use variable deformation, you use variation in them, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. In some way, yeah. So probably one comment about in the Riemannian case by uh, Shen Yao is they use this as a 
variation for the mass. So it's very natural you want to say, it, since it's a mass minimizer, you variation using the mass, right? But here, uh, it will not work directly. So we actually have to find a slightly different function of which will be the mass together with the integral, the bulk integral, which is a constraint scalar coverage equation integrate inside. So that's what this rigid tidal Hamiltonian is. But the uh, basic idea is very along the same direction. Yes, okay, no, no. Right. So um, I, I think I'm out of time. So probably just make a remark. Uh, this argument also work for so-called the asymptotic locally hyperbolic manifold, which is the class of manifold which has conformal boundary have uh, to have different topologies. So like a, a torus, or surfaces of higher genus, not only just a sphere. But in that case, uh, it's more complicated just because there's an example of uh, Horowitz Meyer matrix, which is the one with negative mass. People actually conjecture it has to be um, the minimum um, mass among all the asymptotic locally hyperbolic manifold with toroidal conformal boundary. But then what we do is we characterize a class which is um, somehow with boundary. So the example is complete without boundary. But if we add a boundary, then you can characterize another class of manifold, which is called Birmingham. Um, let's see the name. I think it's called Birmingham Cartelet matrix, which has boundary. And somehow you describe something with black hole using this boundary. OK, uh, but I think I'm down here since I'm out of time.